Good morning, everyone, and welcome to morning service with Crescent Church. I hope you've been keeping safe and well in this past week, even though we continue to be isolated from our friends and some of our family. And I know all the young people are really desperate to get back to school as soon as possible. This morning, we will be continuing to learn from God's word about how Christians can live healthy, useful lives in this world. Uh, we have been studying the book of 1 Peter under the general theme of living in exile. And this morning, David Russell will be speaking to us from chapter 4. We've been living in this rather unusual and strange world for over two months now. And that reminds me a little of the first song which we are going to sing. It tells us about how the Lord Jesus left his home in heaven and came into this strange world to live and then to return to his home in heaven. The song is called The Servant King and it begins with these words. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled. It tells us how the Lord Jesus, even though he was God and a king, lived in this world as a servant, serving other people. Let's sing it together now.
Let's commit our time together this morning to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, into this world. It is amazing to think that he humbled himself and lived in this world in such a way that ordinary people could see what God was really like without being frightened or running away. We pray that during our time this morning, we would learn more about the Lord Jesus and more about the special way of life that he calls us to. We take this time to pray for our government, as you have asked us to. We ask that you would give them wisdom as they plan the long and gradual path to getting us back to a more normal way of life, as they seek to get the economy going again as quickly as possible. We pray for ourselves too, that everyone in our country would continue to be patient and to keep to what the government says. We continue to pray for all those in the medical profession, including those in care homes who have been under so much pressure in recent weeks. Keep them safe from the virus too, we pray. And we pray for our society. We pray that we would all learn important lessons from this time. We have had to live without rather superficial entertainment and it has forced many of us to appreciate more fundamental things like talking to one another in our family and even thinking about bigger questions which we would not normally have thought about. We pray that we will not simply go back to what we were before. We pray that our whole community will be more considerate at the end of this time and less taken up with things that are not really important. Now we place ourselves into your hands for the rest of our time together this morning. Amen. Now we're going to hear a story, especially for the kids. Emma McMullen is going to read it to us. Now I'm not going to tell you who it's about, but it was about a young man who was suddenly isolated from his family. In fact, for several years he was totally isolated from almost everybody. And yet, through all his difficulties, God was preparing him to play an important part in God's amazing plan to save the world at that time. After that, we're going to sing a chorus, which has got fairly lively actions. So get loosened up for, for when we sing, Jesus' love is very wonderful. The Forgiving Prince Jacob had twelve sons, but of all his sons, Joseph was his favourite. One day, Jacob gave Joseph a splendid new robe. It was beautiful and rich with all the colours of the rainbow, but it made Joseph's brothers jealous. They wanted rich rainbow robes too. Then, to make matters worse, Joseph kept on having these special dreams. I dreamt I was the greatest. I was king, Joseph told his brothers, and you all bowed down to me. Now I'm sure you know, even if Joseph didn't, that telling your brothers things like that isn't a very good idea. Joseph's brothers hated him even more. They wanted to kill Joseph and his dreams. And one day, that's exactly what they tried to do. They tore Joseph's rainbow robe off him and sold him to slave traders for 20 pieces of silver. The traders took Joseph to Egypt and made him into a slave. The brothers went home and lied to their father, telling him that Joseph was dead. That's the end of that dreamer, they thought, but they were wrong. God had a magnificent dream for Joseph's life. And even when it looked like everything had gone wrong, God would use it all to help make the dream come true. God would use everything that was happening to Joseph to do something good. Meanwhile, though, things were not looking good for Joseph in Egypt. He was far from home and from his dad. Then he got blamed for something he didn't do. And even though he had done nothing wrong, he was punished and thrown in jail, but God had not left Joseph. 
One night, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had a scary dream about thin cows gobbling up fat cows. What on earth did it mean? He didn't know, but Joseph was a dream expert, so Pharaoh sent for him. It means a famine is coming, Joseph explained. There won't be enough food. Pharaoh was so pleased by Joseph's skill that he immediately took Joseph out of jail and made him a prince. Now back home, Joseph's brothers had run out of food and everyone was hungry. God's special family was in danger. If they didn't get food soon, they would starve to death. So Joseph's brothers travelled to Egypt to buy food. They came and knelt before the new prince. His brothers didn't know that the prince was Joseph, but Joseph knew who they were. Joseph's dream the one about his brothers bowing down to him, was coming true. It's me, Joseph cried. When they saw it was Joseph, his brothers were afraid. They had wronged Joseph. They had sinned and they knew it. Now Joseph would certainly punish them. But Joseph looked at his brothers and his eyes filled with tears. Even though his brothers had hurt him and hated him and wanted him dead, In spite of everything, he couldn't stop loving them. His heart, which they had broken, filled up with love, and Joseph forgave them. Joseph threw his arms around them. Don't be afraid, he said. Behind what you were doing, underneath everything that was happening, God was doing something good. God was making everything right again. Joseph didn't punish them. He rescued them. He brought God's special family to live safely with him in Egypt. One day, God would send another prince, a young prince whose heart would break. Like Joseph, he would leave his home and his father. His brothers would hate him and want him dead. He would be sold for pieces of silver. He would be punished even though he had done nothing wrong. But God would use everything that happened to this young prince, even the bad things, to do something good. To forgive the sins of the whole world. love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful oh wonderful love so high you can't get over it so low you can't get under it so wide you can't get round it oh wonderful love love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful oh wonderful love so high you can't get over it so low you can't get under it so wide you can't get round it oh wonderful love Thanks, Emma, for reading that wonderful story to us. What a perfect young man Joseph was. Now we're going to sing another hymn together. It's called 10,000 Reasons, and it begins with the words of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul.
Our speaker this morning is David Russell. David is well known to us here in the Crescent. He leads the Sunday classes for the young people and he's one of our regular Bible teachers. We've been working through the book of First Peter in recent weeks and this morning David will be speaking to us on the first half of chapter 4 under the title Keepers of God's Grace. Now just before David comes to speak to us we're going to have the passage read to us by Rupin Pilibosian. The reading for this Sunday is from 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. We're really glad that you could join with us. Over these few weeks, we've been studying the first letter written by the Apostle Peter. This letter was written in the early 1860s, around 30 years or so after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. By this time, Peter was a leader in the church in Rome, and he wrote this letter to groups of Christians spread throughout Asia Minor, which is found in modern-day Turkey. Peter had learned that they were facing persecution for their faith, so he wrote this letter to urge them to remain faithful to Christ. And Peter has a very interesting way of describing them. He calls them elect exiles of the dispersion. As believers, we are living in exile. Christians are dispersed throughout the whole world today, but of course our citizenship is elsewhere. We are spiritual exiles awaiting our heavenly inheritance. Christians are chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world and set apart for his will and his glory. And in these studies, we've been delving into what Peter says about how that should impact on our day-to-day behaviour. And so far, Peter has reminded these suffering Christians of the sheer magnitude of what Christ has achieved for them on the cross, guaranteeing our future inheritance in him. And how that should then be an incentive for us to live holy lives. And then he focused in on how we can pursue goodness in every area of life, both publicly and privately. How we should conduct ourselves as citizens, as workers and as husbands and wives. And then he turned the spotlight more directly to the immediate problem of their suffering. Persecution against believers was commonplace in the Greco-Roman world. Being in the world but not of the world made them seem like misfits. And of course it was difficult for them under those conditions to keep going on in their faith. But Peter tells them to endure that hardship with the glory of eternity in mind. To keep in mind their final reward. They could rejoice in spite of their sufferings because they had already won the victory in Christ who has triumphed over all. So off the back of that, he writes these verses that Reuben read to us. And can I encourage you to have your Bibles open as we go through it together. In verses 1 to 6, he says that when they suffer for their faith, to give themselves completely over to God and to keep doing what's right. Because secondly, in verses 7 to 11, he reminds them that the end of all things is at hand. So firstly, in verses 1 to 6, Peter begins with this great rallying cry. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves 
with the same way of thinking. They were resident aliens in a system that wasn't where they truly belonged. And they stuck out like a sore thumb. Truly following Christ, following his teachings and following his values, made conflict with Greco-Roman society inevitable because the gospel was totally countercultural. And whenever the heat was on, Peter knew that their natural response would be to run as far away from suffering as they could. Peter knew that from bitter experience because on the night whenever the Lord Jesus was arrested, every disciple ran away, including him. Within a few hours, Peter had publicly denied not just that he was a follower and a friend of Jesus, but he denied that he knew him at all. And of course, Peter was restored and he went on to lead the early church. But even after all these years, he never forgot that denial. He never forgot how he had reacted whenever following Jesus would prove costly, whenever it would mean real suffering for him. And he wanted to make certain that these young churches didn't repeat his mistake. He didn't want them to let the Lord down like he had done. He didn't want them to become useless in their faith. So he gives out this urgent call to arm themselves with Christ's way of thinking. The word arm literally means to take up weapons, to take an active, intentional role in warfare. They were on a spiritual battlefield and they needed to be equipped. And the equipment they needed was the mind of Christ, as some older translations put it. But what does Peter mean by that? Well, he's really talking about Christ's mindset. He's talking about his purpose and his intent and his resolve, leading to specific action for a specific purpose. So what was Christ's way of thinking whenever he suffered in the flesh? Well, Hebrews 12 puts it like this. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured what came his way submissively and patiently with unwavering trust in the wisdom and the love of his Father. Even though he had done nothing to deserve suffering, he fully entrusted himself to God with one goal in mind, to do his Father's will. So with the Holy Spirit's help, we are to follow him in that same attitude. We are to put on his mindset, to patiently endure the dark times, in submission to our Father who knows everything that we're going through. This morning, lots of us might be struggling with our health, with financial fears, with job insecurity, with the loss of a loved one, with mental health problems. And it's not fair. We're doing our best to live for God and we can't understand why all this is happening. Can I gently encourage you to consider the Lord Jesus? To consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Think how every step of the road to Calvary was marked with quiet confidence in his God and unyielding determination to carry out his will, even to the extent of Calvary. Meditate on him. Get alone every day, and even for a few minutes, set your mind on Christ. At the moment, I'm working my way through Mark's Gospel with a 40-day study guide, and it's been a really helpful way of lifting my mind away from all the other stuff that's going on, and resting it on Jesus. And maybe that's something that you can do as well. Use the time during lockdown to read over the gospel accounts again with a study guide or a devotional and soak in the character of Jesus. Get to know his way of thinking and ask God to build his mind into you. That is vital for any disciple because Peter says that giving ourselves completely over to him being willing to suffer and keep doing what's right, has an incredible practical outcome. He says, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, 
so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Christ's suffering, of course, has saved us from the penalty of sin. And the mind of Christ within us saves us from the power of sin every day. It's almost like the nerve centre of sin in our lives is cut off. But how does that work? Well, whenever we're determined to live righteously, when we resist the pressure to just go along with sin, to use language we shouldn't use, or to choose relationships that God might not approve of, then that naturally brings suffering, both from the inside, from our old nature fighting against our new nature, and from the outside, from a culture that rejects Christ's values. But it also gives us freedom practically from the sin that we're resisting. It proves that our lives aren't dominated by it anymore. It proves that we have broken with that. We have reckoned ourselves dead to it. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. We'll never be completely free of sin until glory. But it does mean that we don't have to sin anymore. Remember, Christ has won the victory for us through the cross. So whenever we apply the cross, whenever we take up our cross daily with the mind of Christ and we cooperate with his spirit, we have the power to overcome and to live for God's will. Peter says the time is past for living for sin. That's not what Christ saved us for. He saved us so that we could pursue the Father's will. It must have been very tempting at times for these believers to just throw their hands up in the air, just for an easier life. They must have thought to themselves, what does it matter if I go along with what everyone else is doing? I'm going to heaven anyway. And why shouldn't I enjoy myself a bit? Why should it matter if I get drunk every once in a while? Or if I have some intimate relationships? Well, Peter says it matters because that's not why Christ suffered. That's not why he was beaten and scourged and nailed to the cross. That's not why he took all of your sin and my sin. That's not why he faced the eternal wrath of the Almighty and went down into death. That's not why he gave everything he had for you. Just so that we could keep living the same way. He did it so that we would be free from the kind of wasted life that Peter talks about in verse 3. Sensuality, passions, drunkenness. So that we would be liberated to live the way that human beings were always designed to. To live for God. Imagine for a moment that... Your teenage son or daughter has a really messy bedroom. And some of you might not have to imagine that. Their clothes are all over the place. The carpet is covered in dirty stains. There's slices of half-eaten pizza lying on the bed. So you go in and you roll up your sleeves and you tidy the whole thing up. And it takes you ages. Only for you to poke your head in the next day and find that the room is as bad as it ever was. Now, you didn't do all of that work just so that the room could go back to the way it was, did you? So, imagine how it must hurt the Lord when we go back to that kind of lifestyle again. Whenever he has suffered so much to free us from the power of that. Imagine how it must hurt him when our whole way of life and our whole way of thinking denies not only that we follow him, but that we know him at all. Maybe we should ask ourselves how we'll feel on that day when we finally see his face. When we see that face that was bruised and spat on for us. Will you be able to look him in the eye, knowing that you have truly followed him? Or will you want to shrink away in shame? Peter knew what that kind of shame felt like. And he didn't want that for them. And he doesn't want it for us. Yes, it's costly to follow Jesus. Our friends and our family might not like it. Especially if we come from another religious background. For some people, it means their families want nothing more to do with them. And in society, it means we're misunderstood. And marginalised. Even hated. 
when we hold firm to the biblical definition of marriage, we won't be very popular. We might be opening ourselves up to suffering. But praise God that we can arm ourselves with the mind of the one who endured misunderstanding and accusation his whole life. The one who knows what it's like. The very same one who one day will bring everyone to account. So even when the pressure is on, even when we suffer, armed with the mind of Christ, Peter says, keep doing God's will. And it's important to be resolute and urgent about that. Because in verses 7 to 11, Peter reminds them that the end of all things is at hand. There's an echo here of what the Lord said to Noah when he was about to send the flood. He said, the end of all flesh is come before me. And in a similar way, the time is near when God will again deal with the world that has rejected him. The judge of all the earth is ready. Peter doesn't mean that he expected Christ to return in a few weeks or a few months' time. He means that all of the major events in the great salvation plan of God have already taken place. So Christ's return could happen at any time. It was at hand in Peter's day, which means, of course, that it's even closer for us today. And Peter wants all believers to live in the light of that. On my very first day of primary school, whenever my mum dropped me off in the classroom, I mustn't have been too enthusiastic about it, because as she said goodbye and she turned to leave, I said to her, Mum, I'm just going to sit right here and wait for you to come back. I think that was an early indication of my interest in school. But I wasn't there to just wait for her to come back again, was I? I was actually there for a reason. And it's the same for us. We are not here to just gaze passively into heaven waiting for the Lord to return. We are to be self-controlled and sober-minded. We are to be watchful. And alert. Christ told Peter and the other disciples the very same thing in Matthew 24 when he talked about the end times. And here Peter says we are to be watchful and alert for the sake of our prayers. Now he doesn't mean praying to God for the things that we want. He actually means praying for the fulfillment of God's purposes. For his will to be done. That his kingdom will continue to expand and that the gospel will reach hearts and lives who need him. The time is short, and we don't know how short. So we have to be urgent in this. We have to be urgent in our prayers. If you're watching this morning and Christianity is new to you, then we're really glad that you've taken the time to listen in. And the incredible news for you is that God wants to bring you into his own family. He wants to give you eternal life with him. His son, the Lord Jesus, paid the price on the cross to make that possible. So there's nothing that you have to do except ask him to forgive you and to come into your life. And for those of us who have done that, God actually wants us to work together with him to bring about his purposes, which is incredible, isn't it? God wants us to pray to him for his will to be done. He wants us to bring people and situations before him. I wonder how vigilant and consistent we are about praying for people who need the Lord. Praying for people who don't know him. Our neighbours, our colleagues, our friends. I don't know about you, but I have a very selfish prayer life most of the time. Especially if I'm going through something hard. I spend most of my time asking for God to take me out of those situations. But Peter wants us to get into the habit of praying something different. Of praying, thy will be done. He wants us to focus in on the mind and the will of God, whatever we are going through. And to pray for that will to be done. And to pray primarily for people who are outside of Christ. Be urgent and persistent about praying for his will so that we can maximise our usefulness for the kingdom of God. And in light of the end of all things, Peter then says, above all, keep loving one another 
earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. With opposition and suffering coming at them from every direction, love for each other as Christians was vital. Agape love. The very love that God himself showed us with all of its compassion and all of its undeserved grace. The idea of covering a multitude of sins is actually the idea of stretching our love out over other people. It's really the image of an athlete stretching themselves to the limit. And the idea is that whenever we make mistakes with each other, whenever we fall down and we get it wrong, Peter doesn't want us to emulate the people that he talked about in verse 4. He doesn't want us to bring each other down. He doesn't want us to malign one another. He wants us to stretch God's love out over each other as far as we possibly can. Now he doesn't mean that we should tolerate persistent sin in our church. But he is saying that whenever we stumble, and we all do, don't drag each other's mistakes out in front of others. Don't tear one another down. Don't say, did you hear what such and such has done? Have you heard what they've been up to? And wait till I tell you about what I found out about this person. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Gossip and slander isn't loving one another. That isn't Christ's way of thinking. Do what he did for you. Bury each other's wrongs out of sight. Love earnestly. And then he points to a practical way of proving that love. And the practical way he points to is hospitality. In the Greco-Roman world, taking someone into your home for a meal or to stay was a real service to them because the inns where travellers stayed in those days could be really unpleasant places filled with all kinds of vices and dangers. So Peter's challenge was to strengthen their Christian bonds by opening their homes to one another. If you've ever been invited to someone's house for lunch, maybe after the service on a Sunday morning, it's amazing how quickly and how deeply you connect with people over a meal, isn't it? And of course that's not possible for us to do in that way at the moment. But opening our homes to one another is something that we should all be determined to get back into the way of doing as soon as we're possibly able to. Both to people in the church that we know and also to people that maybe we don't know quite so well. Now Peter was well aware that hospitality could be exhausting and it could be expensive. But he encourages us to keep at it because there is no better way of forming meaningful connections with each other and encouraging each other and building each other up. It really helps to strengthen the ties between the members of the body of Christ. And then lastly, Peter wants us to express Christian love by using our spiritual gifts. One of the many incredible things about being a Christian is that whenever the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he gives each of us at least one spiritual gift, a God-given ability that we can use to serve him. He has entrusted these gifts to us as stewards or as keepers. A steward would look after the needs of the household that they managed. And Peter calls us stewards of God's varied grace. The word varied there actually means multicoloured. The gifts that he gives are infinitely varied with all different kinds of shades and tones. And whenever a church is faithful in using its gifts, it brings to life the many coloured splendour of God's amazing grace, which builds up the body of Christ and also paints a very striking picture for the world outside to see. A picture that the world can't help but be drawn to. And Peter says, use those gifts to serve one another. But what does a spiritual gift look like? Well, Peter divides them into two main types. Speaking and serving. Public ministry and personal service. Firstly, those who share God's word are to speak the oracles of God. And that's an Old Testament expression that means a divine saying. For those of us who speak 
publicly. We have a huge responsibility to speak the very words of God himself. Standing up in front of people or talking to a Bible study group or even talking to people one-on-one is not an opportunity for us to give our opinions. And it's not an opportunity for us to show off or to make ourselves feel in any way important. It is only to present God's revealed truth from the scriptures for the building up of the church. Nothing added, nothing taken away. Now I know that that challenges me personally. All of us who share God's word in any way have to keep a constant check on our hearts and root out any false motives or agendas that might be lurking in there. And then secondly, there's personal service. And most times this is done behind the scenes. It's not standing on a stage or behind a pulpit. It's private and practical. But that doesn't mean it's less important. Paul taught in 1 Corinthians that it's very often the hidden members of the body that are the most vital. God has given us people who are gifted technically to help out with the online services. He's given us gifted musicians. He's given us gifted organisers. We've been gifted with prayer warriors who faithfully pray for the members of the church every day. We've been gifted with encouragers who look out for people and build them up in their faith. And most of the time, no one else sees what those people are doing for others. But we can be assured that God sees. And because God sees our service, we are never to be half-hearted about it. Whatever our gift might be, we are to make full use of the resources and the abilities and the strength that God has given us to love and to serve. Not to draw attention to ourselves in any way, but to draw all of the attention to the Lord. And if you don't know what your gift is, then ask God to show it to you. And most importantly, be willing to use it. That in everything, as Peter concludes in verse 11, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That he would be magnified and extolled and praised in everything, in how we endure suffering and keep doing as well, in how we love others, and in how we use the gifts that he has given us. That's what following Christ is all about, isn't it? Living obedient and loving and serving lives through the mind and the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord help each of us to live for him and to shine his multicoloured grace to a world in darkness. Let's close our time together in prayer. Our Father, we're grateful for the perfect example of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to you. Father, we thank you that he was willing to do that for us. We thank you that your will was paramount in his mind every day of his life. We pray for your help to follow that amazing example, to put on the mind of Christ and to live for you in a determined way, for your will, even when it means that we might suffer. Help us, Lord, to endure for your name. Help us to use the opportunities and the gifts that you have given us as faithful stewards of the amazing grace that you've lavished upon us in Christ, in whose precious and worthy name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Jesus, All for Jesus. And the words of this song really touch on the challenge at the core of our passage this morning. All of my ambitions, hopes and plans, I surrender these into your hands. So as we sing together, let's give thanks in our hearts for all that the Lord has done for us. And let's be determined again to live our lives all for Jesus. <laughs>